Would you mind mentioning all my shows are coming out on BBC Two at the end of August? Nope. I would love to mention that. They're doing clips of all my shows for three hours. Um, All the shows that you've done? Yeah. I mean, the the big ones like uh, O.J. Simpson, Donald Trump, um, Madonna. Amazing. Three hours I talk. Um, about what it's like 25 years later. So they put me in a room for eight days and I had to watch all of this. Yeah. And how do you feel about it? I don't know who that person is who played me. <laughs> what happened to her? Where is she? Why is she different? Well, she, um, she was, she's not so desperate anymore, but she was appropriate at that age. You know, she, it would be a tragedy if she was still running around now. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, the stripes were making me dizzy. <laughs> that looks fantastic. Well, where are you actually? Are you in the UK at the moment or? No, I'm in New York. I do want to say how very excited I am to see you again. You won't remember this, but I met you in the 90s when I started work as a journalist at The Big Issue and you were absolutely fantastic. I've admired you for decades. I used to come and I used to have bits of paper and I ask you to, to fill in my celebrity questionnaire. I lost my questionnaire and I, I think I asked you again and you just filled it in again. So I, that's how hopeless I was. Hello, welcome to Sketch Notes on a Pandemic. I'm Lucy Johnston, Health and Social Affairs Editor of the Sunday Express, and I'm very excited to be talking to Ruby Wax about her new book, A Mindfulness Guide for Survival. You started to write this book. Was it before the lockdown, before COVID? No, I wrote the other book, um, and now for the good news, then that comes out again in January. So that was written before the lockdown. And um, that was great timing because... uh, I was looking for the kind of green shoots of hope in yes. different areas of you know, weather. And we were being bombarded then by terrible news. And I thought, I don't want to get sucked into this because that's seriously bad for your health and it's addictive. So I intentionally traveled around to find people that were so inspired, not people, but education, schools, um, what was happening in tech, what was happening in business. So I could really see if we turned our focus to people that were, and companies that were, and educational systems that were really changing the paradigm, then I would feel better. It's always about me. (laughs) (laughs) That's not true, I don't think. I knew it had to be out by August because I thought by, by Christmas, we might just be skipping out of our house. You know how people pretend everything okay and then it's that trauma sits in you like a grenade so I thought get it out while we still remember it is timely because we have got a traumatized nation you've been running the frazzled cafes and that really gave you as you've said a front seat into what people were experiencing and then that is probably almost not many people had that you know there was the sort of people talking about epidemiology and the kind of zoom classes who could order their lovely waitrose deliveries but there were people as well who haven't really had much of a voice who were deemed essential workers and had to go out to work and had to carry on and had to look after the kids and these people perhaps you might think I don't know do you think haven't had much of a voice but you've seen how people have been coping through the lockdown and I, I'd love to share some of that with you yeah, well that motivated me to write that book because I feel like I you know you take a cross section and interview them but now I could they would come into my home and also it kept my sanity during lockdown I had my community every night and I was closer to some of these people than I were some of my friends because the rules of Frazzle Cafe are we don't talk about the news. This isn't therapy. And you just speak uh, from the heart. You know, I always, it starts off, what are the weather conditions going on in your mind? And people got that. And they, would, they wouldn't they would whine the way they do on radio. You know, it's an airing time to bark. Um, but they would really say they're, what was, you know, and this is a cross section and these were national health workers who were their brains were fried and this is what's older people that were terrified and still are because i'm still running frazzle cafe you're right and it was kids that um were banging off the walls and mothers with kids so i got that cross section and i heard night after night at night after night them having to face those realities that we never face in real life so i those themes 
to um, uh, make a workbook on how to deal with it next time we're caught with our pants down, which we're still got our pants down. We still have. And tell me about those things that we were facing. And I know you've identified six areas that we were forced to confront, which we don't normally do. As you've said in your book, we're busy on our di- red digital rectangle uh, screens all the time. We're busy fools almost. And we were forced to face some realities of life. And let's talk about those. And and you've highlighted this in your book very beautifully. Our addictions uh, to these uh machines or you know these distractions and i always say we're at the mercy of weapons of mass distraction is that um we didn't want to face those things that was the very reason we've all been so busy you know in a kind of um obsessive way because nobody i talked to businesses you know big businesses and law firms and um the government they're so surprised about that everything changes are we talking about the basics here or there is uncertainty? There's always uncertainty. You know, okay, we didn't know the epidemic was coming, but every day is a, is a crapshoot. And uh, and why we don't face that and why kids, well, now I did see from writing and now for the good news, they are training kids to have resilience so that they can take the blows. You know, they can deal with high levels of stress. That's being taught in schools. And to me, that's the most important. But adults were suddenly, oh my God, I didn't realize there was change. Are you still being potty trained? You didn't realize there was change? What kind of world do you think we're in? And um, do you think you're in control of it? Uh, so the, the, the realities are, um, you know, uncertainty. And these would be the themes coming up every night, you know, as if they're slapped in the face with this existential hit that they've been facing since the beginning of time. Do you think back in time, 50, 100 years ago, people coped with uncertainty better? And do you think there are people who don't like uncertainty and some do? Where, where, where do you think we sit with that? I think, you know, we, we were more at the mercy of the of the, the weather. <laughs> you know, and, you know, yeah. day, and then the crops didn't survive. You know, people were much more in touch with nature. And now all, I'm not and I'm not saying I want to live out there in an igloo. I'm just saying we lost our touch with anything uh, that really exists because nature's in charge. We're not. Uh, so we think, oh, well, I'll just go to the fridge and my food will be frozen. You know, this is obvious stuff. I'll just pick up my phone and I'll be connected to whatever. So we, we're we limp. You know, our muscles stop working to understand that there's bigger issues than we are. I mean, this would be controversial, but we're doing so much to avoid death and to avoid, you know, to, to save every single life without looking necessarily as much at the impact assessment of doing that and the ripple effect of what we're doing to save every life, which of course is a very laudable thing and we do try to preserve life. Do you think that perhaps um, in another era before 24-7 news and we've had a lot of a diet, haven't we, of pictures of death and dying, do you think we may have responded differently? You know, And there's also Twitter feeding into that and all the social media, or is it impossible to know? That's impossible to know. I mean, you know, the the media is in control of our emotions, so they know how to switch it on that we can see a whole nation nation uh, disseminated. But there's music playing under it, and then a whale is beached in um, Upper Mongolia, and they know how to make our hearts bleed. So we're quite confused. I, I, I'm not a moral. I don't. I, that's not my area to say whose life we should save. I'm just saying everything is manipulated, and we really needed to have a little insight, you know, to say what's my reaction. I don't care what the public's reaction is. What personally is my reaction? And however appalling it is, or whatever, at least it's truth. People should admit, if they can't stop watching the news, why are they watching it? Okay, you need to know the basics, but you don't have to listen to the death tolls every day. Because, again, we lose touch with what's the reality. Am I listening because um, there by the grace of God go I? What's your point? You know, do you need to know minute by minute? Meanwhile, what that's doing to your health is off the chart. You know, your stress will kill you far (laughs) earlier and COVID will. So I listen to these people burning themselves out, worried that this thing, and of course there's worry, but we're living in a society about stress, about stress, about stress. We're packing it on, you know, we're aware of it. And so we're beating ourselves up for feeling it. It's the weirdest thing. We're so mean to ourselves. Like, why should I feel this way? Nobody else feels this way. I shouldn't be lonely. Nobody else. This comparison, I don't know whether it's social media. It's not for me to say, 
and I'm not telling saying turn it off. You know, I love technology. You can order a husband to do it in the morning. What do I care? But when is enough enough for me, not for you? I might only, you might be able to do 10,000 emails, jog at two in the morning, make a muffin and have 17 children. I would be dead. <laughs> and we hear people who are these, you know, uber menches, you know, oh, we should be like that. We shouldn't. That's just their body can take it. It's going to kill me. Um, and people, the guilt of, I can't get out of bed, or I feel so afraid. That was what was great about Frazzle. People were saying it. And other people were going, yeah, me too. And that relieves people, not watching more news. Did you see a difference in the what people were saying? I'm sure you did. That's an obvious question. But you did Frazzled for, the, for two years, did you, before the... Um, four years, a long time. So you've been running that for a long time. It's free and uh, it's a, a, a resource that anyone can use. But what happened during the lockdown? What did you notice? And you know what What do you bring from that to try and help people really? Well, lockdown, uh, we all went on a journey together. You know, I, I have to remember, I have a, a calendar that shows what I was doing every day. We framed it because it looks like a mad woman. There's different colors, there's more activities than I even did in my real life. I was learning how to cook. I don't know how to cook, you know, and I'm scared of cooking because my mother put her hand in the flame of a stove when I was five to say how dangerous fire was. Show me a kitchen and I'm dripping in sweat. Piano. I was learning Beethoven with one finger. I was running from one activity to the other, but so was everybody else on Frazzle. I mean, they didn't, we would hover until we went through the center of the earth. You know, I I wash my in a panic wash my refrigerator in fabric softener. We just <laughs> distracted, and you took away our toys of distraction. So we're now floundering, going, "Oh my God, how can I cover the reality of things that are waiting for me? Death, loneliness. We were always lonely. We were always going to die. There was always change. There were always uncomfortable um, emotions, and now it was hitting you in the face." So that was such an inspiration for writing this book on how to deal with it. Do you think that we need to perhaps change the message a bit? Because we are a traumatized nation and we had a very powerful message of why we need to stay in and why we need to lock down and the dangers and the threat. Do you think perhaps we need to reverse that and use the same messages and the same techniques to perhaps unwind people's fears and anxieties because we are in a different place from March 2020 and we've accepted or lots of people accepted we've got to live with this virus you know Valance and Witty have said like mainstream thinking you know we can't get rid of it now do you think we need to adjust the the messaging I think forget the messaging each person has to find their own message there is no messaging. What are you going to say? Hey, everybody, come out of your house. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. So we have to find what's, you, you know, there has to be some introspection. Uh, we have to look inside and say, what, what really is my fear? I mean, I realize now, just because I'm so interested in this kind of stuff, that the reason I was so ambitious and so busy is I'm scared of dying. I thought it was because, you know, I wanted to do so much. And it doesn't matter. But once you, ping your um, reality. I never used that word before, but once you hit it, um, life becomes easier. And it's somebody said, this is a great expression. I didn't make it up. Um, if you face the monster, it runs from you. But if you run from the monster, it chases you. When you sort of go, oh, is that why I did it? In a way, it's the only way you can forgive yourself. And if you can forgive yourself for these four, you know, these human glitches, which, you know, we who said we were supposed to be perfect? Where was that rule book? That's another problem. We're flawed. We're completely shot through with flaws. And you have to acknowledge it. And then you start to see the flaws in other people. And then you start to love other people. I don't want to know how fine they are. I don't want to know how much they've accomplished. I don't need to hear the bad news either, but I need to see a sign of life to say I'm vulnerable. And um, when people start facing stuff, I mean, my last chapter is about death, but it isn't about, oh my God, let's you know start digging the hole now. It makes life... Um, every second more poignant. So your decisions are more truthful. It's about uh, facing impermanence, but that means like, you know, your yogurt goes off, your job's going to go, your beauty's going to go, but that not, don't panic today, but just, you know, when you know that things are, what what's really going to feed you? And it's at different ages, like it, when you're 20, 
have friends, go be ambitious, turn on the turbo. But at a certain point in life, you have to go, well, I have to reinvent now because this is my skin. You know, that's what I did with TV a little bit. It's like my skin didn't fit my soul. You know, I thought, boy, we better change this. And I'm in the same place. If you jump early, you can reinvent. I mean, humans are so capable. If you're hungry and you need money, you have to do what you can. I'm talking from a position of privilege. Yes, you've talked a lot about neuroplasticity and understood that from a very from an organic and you know from a medical scientific level with your master's degree in uh, was it mindfulness based cognothera- cognotherapy. So, um, do you think? I mean, wh- well, two questions: Were you always afraid of your own mortality? Had you ever thought about it before, or did the pandemic sharpen the focus on that? I knew I was lonely for since I was a kid. And so I use, um, the reason I make contact at a frenetic level is because I want to build kind of an igloo of protection, protecting me from violent parents. I mean, okay, I know that I don't need to see a shrink every day and mention it again and again, because then you'll embed it. But um, besides knowing about that I'm going to die, which I didn't, I really don't believe I am, but, you know, (laughs) that I don't waste my time anymore, you know. It really does. I don't really do stuff unless I'm paid a lot of money. (laughs) Unless it's for love or compassion. I mean, and that's why, I mean, bully for me. I know that I'll get this rush of this chemical that is good for my health if I do something kind. So I do work. I did work at St. Charles during, you know, giving out, I didn't give the vaccines or I will work in a food bank or whatever. I never did those things before, but I know how good it is for my health you get this rush of oxytocin and that's the antidote to the cortisol, the stress hormone. So for selfishly, I'm doing nice things, but they make me feel good. So feel good. if I'm going out partying, but you always did. It's not a new thing. (laughs) Uh, I I don't recognize that. I'm sorry. You filled in a questionnaire twice for the big issue. You didn't need to do that. You were already famous and you have been and done so much for people, including myself. So I'm sorry, I don't think you're selfish in any way. And the fact that you wrote this book was not a selfish act. You are trying to help. And there's lots of um, exercises in there. I mean, one of the questions I was going to ask you, do you think mindfulness is enough for some people who are in a very dark place? I mean, I just spoke to the postman earlier who said, if we have another lockdown, I think I'll commit suicide. And I've heard many people say things like that. Do you think that uh, they may, may need adjunctive other things to help. First of all, the gov- you know, whoever's in charge should make a distinction between mental illness and mental health. You know, there is a moment that the cells turn into cancer. You know, people say there's a moment where it's mental illness, okay? It's like being pregnant and not pregnant. When you have mental illness, you need medication. I'm sorry. You can't wish yourself out of bipolar. If you're a schizophrenic, you can eat as much health food as you want. You're a schizophrenic. Now, where's the psychopharmacologists that are giving the right drugs? That's also, that's a disaster. You know, people need the right medication. You don't go to a, sometimes, but you need a psychiatrist. There aren't enough. And therapy, once you're mentally ill, you need therapy and medication. So we're already losing a battle. I I use mindfulness for the... um, the healthy disturbed, you know, frazzled is not for people with mental illness. Once you're mentally ill, mindfulness ain't going to help because you don't have a mind. Mindfulness is like going to the gym. Once you're broken your legs, you can't go to the gym anymore. When you go into that hole of hell, forget mindfulness. But when I out again, I take medication, but if it worked, we wouldn't have relapse. If it worked, why would I do mindfulness? (laughs) You can look in a brain scanner and see the results of mindfulness. Nuns who pray also have the same results of the amygdala being deactivated. So they're not on fight and flight the whole time. Other people are natural born. You know, they have resilience and they go with the flow. This isn't for everybody. But for those of us who are frazzled, unfortunately, and there isn't tech that will calm you down at this point now. You know, someday they'll have the right equipment to test, oh, your cortisol levels are through the ceiling. So you can stay at work or you can have a heart attack. It's your choice. But we have no inner gauge to say, wait a minute, I'm hitting my tipping point. The only thing, as far as I know, is cognitive therapy, mindfulness, uh, 
but mindfulness is mindfulness is taking the focus from this brain that's keeping you up all night into the body. So athletes are studying how to get focus into the body. Yoga, unless you're competing with 17 year olds and tying your feet into a knot, which is what happens when I do. But if you really did it, you know, and you were in, you know, embodied, Pilates, you're embodied, Tai Chi, you're embodied. If you do it right, martial arts, Tai Chi boy, that really gets you in there. Um, So mindfulness isn't just sitting on a gluten-free cushion. There are other ways to become embodied because we don't use anything from the neck down. Mm-hmm. And the mindfulness, which is why I went to Oxford, not because I thought, let's wave some crystals, is an exercise of the brain. It should be called mind gym or, you know, which is, it it helps you take that, that gabbling up here. And you're not going to go blank, but the, vo- the thoughts become more like a radio in another room. The purpose of it is to be able to self-regulate to be able to demiss the um, frazzledness up here so that I can actually hear what I'm thinking clearly without this gabble, with this interference going on, going, um, pick up some, uh, you know, go shopping now. And I'm at the mercy of this boy in my shopping. Um, go uh, uh, get some drugs, go work harder, go whatever. It, it reduces the anxiety and then you can start to see what you really need to do. I don't know any other ways. And they were teaching it at this school. Um, at Oxford, they weren't teaching witchcraft. So I don't know any other method. No, and I don't think anyone else does. Yeah. And it's not for you. Walk away from this space. Not everything's for everybody. You know, some people go garden or go walk, but understand I'm, well, you can't during lockdown, but um, understand I'm now going, it's off the chart. Rather than whine or panic or beat yourself up, there are things you could do, but you need to find tools. Did you find that those very tools that you knew about kept you from going uh, sort of frazzled? I don't know how you define frazzled, but I can imagine. For a biological word, it means uh, stressed about stress. You know, you're not just stressed, which is kind of good for you for work reasons. But it's this <clears throat> it's this kind of ruminating each thought daisy chains to the next. That's biology. It's not uh, a cute word. I wish I made it up, but I didn't. Um, so, so, do you, so what do you think? I know this is a massive question, but we've seen a lot of stats thrown around, especially with the younger generations. Um, the lockdown itself, it's very, um, well, bad for mental health, of course. What do you fear? What do you see in the future? We've now got a kind of a different landscape, haven't we? Where they're talking about vaccine passports for younger people to go to nightclubs, which is kind of in our DNA, isn't it? To herd, as you've said. What do you worry about in looking at the landscape ahead? When I wrote in now for the good news, I began by saying I'm not a soothsayer, and anybody who thinks they are, again, uncertainty. You know, I they used to read the pig entrails. Uh, and now people that are doing hedge funds believe they can see the future, but we can't. So I don't know. I just know how to save me. If you can cool down your engine, you know, if you can, I don't mean chill. I just mean, you know, see, see steady without the fog, brain fog. Um, then you can help the next person because you're clear. Now you can listen to them without your own agenda going on. So I think it's a ripple effect. I think it starts with the individual and then it moves out. It doesn't start with politics. And um, so if we, if we decide the world might, the future might be good. If we look at what I saw and, and now for the good news, if we look to these people and say, what are you guys doing? And use some of those tools. You don't have to go work at, you know, um, but, or send your kids to these schools. And some of them are state schools where they teach empathy. By the way, their grades are much better because they know how to self-regulate. Um, if you make a concerted effort to find out, and I did give you a Michelin guide to look where the good, the green shoots are, you can use that stuff. I mean, I only wrote it because I wanted to know. How do you make a child resilient? What are the tools that they need? Yeah, it's the teacher has to, first of all, walk the talk. But if you look at, um, there's a couple schools in England, just for example, called Reach 2. It's a state school. They're all over the uh, country. and the way they teach those kids, they're from really disadvantaged neighborhoods. So you can see what the kid might have become because they're slightly nervous. But they learn to say, I'm really nervous. 
or they they do a little circle where they go around and say what they appreciate about the next person. That kindness is imbued in every lesson. Um, you know, little things on the wall to say, what did I, did I upset somebody? What could I have done? How did that person see the world? So they're learning empathy. Then they learn how to self-regulate their emotions. So when they feel themselves, get this, they feel their tipping points. Like, let's say they're going to take an exam, that they're going into a kind of um, cortisol gush. They go into a corner. This is just one tool. And on the wall, there's a, a kind of color, red yellow, green, and they know they're in the red zone. So they're trained to use these tools to bring them down into the yellow zone. <laughs> they have breathing balls and they have, for example, I know this, there's a jar that they, that's full of glitter and they shake it up and they know that, that their mind is like that. And then when the glitter settles, they actually identify with it and their mind settles it down a little bit or whatever calms them into finally the green zone, they have at their fingertips. When they feel that they're homostatic, you know, in that state again, and that they're back down to clear thinking, then they take the exam. So these are kids that are older? Four or five, all the way up. Parents who are, you know, a lot of drug addiction and cr criminal crime um, built them a Zen den. And they also learned to garden. And these kids are teaching each other mindfulness, you know, having them focus on uh, various parts, you know, of, of their physical body so that they're. Um, the, the gabbling starts to calm down. <sighs> they breathe. One kid was looking out and um, at the rain and said that that image reminded him of um, the screaming that goes on in his house, but that the water disperses. They just get these lessons that um, things change, things are uncertain, um, life is hell, but they can float over it. They learn to garden. They didn't know things came out of the ground. And then they get cooking classes and teach their parents. Those are little movements millimeter by millimeter they're affecting the world and imagine these kids when they grow up they won't always blame people for how discomfort how uncomfortable they feel they know that as humans you know we're on a roller coaster anyway but understand it's not the world that's making you feel that way you are <laughs> you've gone into that quite a bit in your book and people say you know this is unfair and life's been cruel to me and you have a way of dealing with that too don't you which is that these are just thoughts. They don't, they're not facts. Some of them are facts, but some of them are. I feel envy, you know, and learn your triggers. That doesn't mean you avoid it. It just means this is the way I think. Wherever I got it, maybe a teacher said I was an idiot. Maybe my parents, you know, did this. But rather than going and blaming them, just go, oh, I get it. That's one of my triggers. Whenever I go near a certain situation, I flip. And again, it's power. Knowledge is power. Only by looking at your habits do they start to break. I have these um like thoughts like everybody else, like I'm not good enough. This isn't making sense. I'm a failure. Why am I talking about this? But I kind of know that they might be recordings. So I see them as um like Spotify. <laughs> you know, this is this album. Oh, yeah, now I got the I'm a failure one. It doesn't mean some of them are true. Sometimes people really hate me. But I don't think everybody hates me, which is how I used to be. It was my habit. If somebody didn't look at me, I assumed, oh, that's because they hate me. Now, it could be because they have their own life. But you're very gregarious, so you've never been afraid of going out there. Oh, no, I have depression. I'm not gregarious. My natural inclination is total negativity. And assuming, you know, I wake up with dread every morning. So, every morning now? Yeah. Really? Well, I wake up and I'm not chirpy. You don't jump uh, out of bed and think, brilliant, brand new day. It's going to be another horror show. <laughs> no, I never count confident. Uh, so I have to work on it. I have and to that's work. been the case since you were little. Well, I didn't know how to work on it then. No. Um, you no. know, I was affected by a lousy childhood, but I, you know, I wrote about it. I used it to build my career because I made it funny. And, um, you know, it is what it is. I don't know what journey my parents were on. You know, I'm sure they were wonderful people, but I, it, we were allergic to each other. So how long am I going to go on about it? I have a proclivity for um, envy and wanting other people to not succeed when they get something I want. And I don't like getting older. You know, that those we're surrounded with those realities. I, I'm, you know, it's my, it's my, 
landscape. Do you like, do you, are you afraid of uncertainty? I mean, you've done a lot. You don't seem to be, I mean, I, I like, I prefer an uncertainty really. I don't like predictability, but that's just me, but you seem to be similar. I I also don't mind change. That's not my main issue. You know, one of those realities, I understand loneliness and I understand high, uh, you know, being badgered or bombarded by difficult emotions. Not everybody's affected by everything, but um, there are some niggling things. And if you're not affected by it, this culture will make sure you are. <laughs> you will be envious. You will start thinking, oh, everybody has what I don't have. Everybody on Twitter is having a great life. It's all around you. <clears throat> They're stoking up your envy. I think people think that we are the way that we are. You know, you're born with a set of genes and that's the way you're going to die. Everything is predestined. But you could argue with me. Um, it's science. I, I can't turn the people who think the world is flat. I can't, you know, that's not my terrain. But there is neuroplasticity. You can change your habits of thinking, more or less. I mean, there's the essence of you because we have memory. So luckily, I wake up tomorrow similar to what I was today. Otherwise, I wouldn't know where my socks were. But as far as habits, you know, every time you learn something, the neurons, you have 82 billion, uh, change their shape. You know, they change their, um, it's like a plate of spaghetti. And when you learn something new, new connections grow. And the denser that forest is, the more flexible you are and the better you are at that skill. So um, with mindfulness, you're training the brain to deactivate, you know, to certain parts to lower the um the stress and other parts of the brain, like the anterior cingulate cortex. I love these <laughs> scientific things. It, that's the area that's in charge of focus. So rather than getting a six pack in the gym by sit, lying down and sitting up, you're exercising this part that can give you focus. Now that's the million dollar reward in this society. You can pay attention when everybody else around you is scattered. So neuroplasticity really means, but neuroplasticity happens when you learn the piano. It happens when you learn language. It happens when you go to school. The reason you learn isn't because, I don't know, some more things go on your chalkboard. It's because you're growing more neurons. But you can use those and train yourself emotional habits or how to break, um, you know, those things that lock you in to an identity that might not be yours. And you know, we're the culprits. If you believe you're a victim, you are a victim. Whatever happened to you? You know, they, there's an experiment. They put electrodes on um, women's eyes who had, who's, who, uh, whose identity was victim. They sent them into a room and they always found the perpetrator in the room. Y you know, you, you find things so that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I believe I'm obnoxious, I'll find somebody who thinks I am. Now, all of these are habits. We aren't born obnoxious. We aren't born victims. It's not in the genes. So you can change that habit of thinking. We're much more. We're much more than introvert and extrovert or kind or cruel. It's a potpourri. Um, so you can start to um, practice something that uh, enhances your compassion. Even if you don't didn't use it in real life, it, there, it, there are structures in the brain that, that can um, make that, that area more resilient. So all of that is possible. Then people say, well, I'm stuck with my genes. Well, now there's something called epigenetics. You can change your genes. Now people say, oh, what? Like tomorrow I'm Einstein. No, tomorrow you're not Einstein, but you can certainly get better in math unless you have a disease. Now, you know, once we get into Alzheimer's or once we get into neurological malfunctioning, this doesn't really, you're in a new way. But for the Average person, whatever that means, you can train this brain. So we're not stuck with who we are. And that's in uh, my book is to say, here's how you retrain. You know, I'm giving you a quick, um, and you fill in things and you draw things and you, you know, it's a, it's a workbook to learn mindfulness. And then we go to the big issues, which is uncertainty, change, loneliness, difficult emotions, death. So now here's how you use these exercises in order to, they don't make it go away, but just be able to deal with it a little bit more. The pandemic and the lockdown has sharpened the focus for us on that. Loneliness was all of those things were there. And, and you talk about the brain wiring and the neuroplasticity. I mean, the idea of lockdown and people being isolated, often alone, kids in their bedroom for 
you know, whatever, best part of two years doing work, those neurons are not able to grow so well. So that will presumably have a detrimental effect on their pathways. So um, what you're saying is perhaps they can grow pathways of learning mindfulness, of resilience, different paths. They may not be learning the piano, but this is an area which they could Look, they're not, they're, they're, it's not, you're not going to get over the loneliness. You're not going to get over the fear. Those are not, that's on the human palate. You're locked in your house. Some people are going to flip. You know, some people have um, a propensity to more trauma than other people do, but you have choices even in lockdown. You could come on to Frazzled. Every, um, I mean, it, it's a horrible situation, but it's not like in the old days where you were locked into an air raid shelter. <laughs> there was nothing. You could learn whatever you want to learn online. I'm not saying I do it. Some people say I can't even read. I'm so terrified. Mm-hmm. Eventually, um, you can. I'm not saying I do, but it's available. There's free courses at Harvard, at Yale, whatever. It's free. You can go online. Um, do you find that online is okay, though? You know, we have a sort of social structure that is tactile as well and the nuance of human emotion but you you're fine with that if you're locked down and you're going i want to hug somebody i want to hug you're locked down so again what's the reality someday you'll get out but you're just going to sit in there and go i have nothing i have nothing i have nothing you'll have a heart attack you'll get (laughs) physically sick and it is horrible i mean i have depression it doesn't mean it goes away i still suffer it but i kind of know when it's coming or I get don't get depressed about depression, but it hurts like hell. So it's not going to be comfortable. Lockdown is a shit show. Um, and there's nothing, there's no tool for that one. But yeah. if you start brooding and going, oh my God, my life is a tragedy. Nobody else is suffering like that. Everybody's suffering like that. Who the hell isn't? Unless you have agoraphobia and then this is your idea of paradise. Did you see in the Frazzled Cafe, did P- did you know of people that did flip? If you had mental illness, I mean, that's just, um, we could, first of all, you have to sign a disclosure saying you're not in the midst of an episode. If you do come on and you are, then we offer help. We give, a, there's a button for need help now, or there's moderators that will take you off and tell you where to go for help. But this is for community. I'm not, I can't do, I'm not, I'm not doing therapy. This is for people who just want community. And that's half the cure. If you don't want to do mindfulness and the irony, you know, is we're in lockdown. How are you going to have community? Well, so I created community. You go online. It's free. I don't know why the government doesn't offer this, you know, or copy what I'm doing. You know, we're happy to train you. And in um, August or in September, we're going to start training people, the public. If you want to have a Brazil cafe, we'll train, you know, we'll, it's not hard. We'll train you how to do it. So you'll make your own community. There's coasts that run it throughout the day. And now we're going to start a scheme where uh, we're going to allow people to say, I would like to start one. Well, if you're lonely, start one. We'll get you the people. The smaller groups are only uh, 12 to 14, because that's what we had in Mark, you know, before lockdown, they were actual cafes in Marks and Spencer's. And people would meet in small groups of 12. When was that? When did they start? Years, uh, 2017. And what made you start them? Because I always wanted a community. So I thought, and I wanted to, you know, I tried to crash AA. <laughs> I don't qualify, but I wanted to have what Quakers had, you know, what we used to have sitting around the fire when we had church or when we had com- family units or whatever. We just don't, or I don't. Some people do, you know, God bless them. You don't need to come. Do you think the shape or the purpose of them is now more needed than ever or different, or it's always been thus? Looking at Twitter and saying, oh, everybody's got stuff going and lonelier and lonelier, you know, until we were just sitting there showing photos of our lunch. (laughs) But the thing is, and kids, they have their gangs. This isn't for everybody. You know, if you have your tribe, you've got it. But as when you get become an adult, it becomes more tricky. Neighborhoods, I don't, you know, if you have a neighborhood, then you're really lucky. Yeah. I mean, we know people, but we don't know each other. So you, yes, yes. And that, and that's how you felt. So did you feel lonely yourself? Yes. Yeah, always throughout my life, whatever, however many people were around. It's just, that's one of my um, glitches. 
but that made me form, uh, that made me create Frazzle. Has that stopped the feelings of loneliness for you? When I'm on, when I'm running those meetings, I'm pretty much in heaven. <laughs> and they all go, thank you for doing this. I go, what do you think I'm getting out of it? I don't talk that much. I let the, you know, I'm holding the, um, I'm holding it for them. I don't, I don't go. And now here's my response. It's theirs. And then they have breakout rooms. I'm not in those breakout rooms and they help, you know, they talk to each other. They don't help each other, but just by hearing that somebody else is in the same predicament from halfway around the world, who's a different color at a different age. If that's not community, nothing is. And so the book is also saying um, the importance of community and how to, how to create it. But the way you create it is by being human and not pretending that you're uber, you know, this uber mensch that we've been doing. Oh, I'm successful. I'm on Love Island. I'm on whatever. Oh, God, I'm not good enough. You know, we it was really divided. And meanwhile, we have to realize that people that have it are also miserable. <laughs> oh, you mean the people who are on Love Island or who are in this yeah. uber place? You know just wealth or whatever we're aiming for isn't necessarily the elixir to happiness. It's inside. It's the stuff in my book. It's inside. It's being able to be present. It's being able to show compassion. It's being able to regulate your cortisol. That's let's call it happiness. So um, I'm amazed this. I'm so grateful. I'm so honored to talk to you. I really think, um, yeah, you've done some, you, you are amazing. Hey. Don't have no confidence. You're a wonderful interviewer. Uh, I, oh, that's the nicest thing. Anyway, I think I'm going to faint. 